Welcome back everyone and I hope you're all refreshed after the morning session and of course those discussion circles. Don't forget if you've not been able to get to some of the sessions or if you'd like to go back and re-watch yesterday's discussions and presentations, the content will be made available to you on demand because all of the sessions are being recorded. We're now about to go uh, to our panel conversation on the sustainable and affordable build to rent housing. I would like to introduce our session moderator, Dr. Georgia Warren Myers, who is Senior Lecturer in Property at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Georgia. Thank you very much. All right, I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather virtually today and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I would also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here and attending today. So today we are exploring the new asset class of the built to rent sector. Now there are great opportunities in terms of this sector and a much misheld myth around that built to rent is equivalent to affordable housing. Now, it actually provides a broad range in terms of, you know, everything from the affordable end all the way up to the premium end. And today we will actually hear from a number of different actors within the market at the moment. There is also the opportunity to ensure that we uh, integrate and ensure more sustainable buildings are built en masse in this level, in this new asset class, so that for current and future generations, these dwellings are going to be more sustainable and viable into the future. So today, I would like to introduce Sean Ryan from Greatstar, Christian Graham from Home Apartments, Cameron Quinn, the Associate Director of Partnerships Assemble, and also Georgia from the University of Melbourne, who is also providing some feedback here as well. So what I would like to do is to provide a bit of a, a brief understanding of the different sectors within the built to rent sector that all of the uh, different players provide. Um, I'm going to ask them to give a short presentation and then we'll move into the questions and Q&A panel. So I would like to start with Sean Ryan from Greystar. Thanks, Georgia. Um, just wait for the slides to uh, to come up. Um, so I work at Greystar. Um, we're a US-based, um, fully integrated uh, real estate company. Um, so we we basically do um, development, construction, and investment. Um, if you can flick to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, as you can see from the map there, um, you know we're spread across the globe. Um, we're obviously heavily, um, you know, invested in, in the US. We're in 48 states there. Our head office is in, in Charleston in South Carolina. Um, across the rest of the world, we're, we're working in 16 countries. Um, more importantly, we actually manage just under 750,000 um, beds and units globally, um, which also gets us in touch with one and a half million residents on a daily basis. Um, and also just over two and a half thousand communities. Internationally, um, the the amenity spaces, um, the communal amenity spaces are actually what really differentiates build to rent from, you know, from more traditional uh, build to sell product types, um, ranging from, you know, communal dining rooms, um, rooftop pools, gyms, um, business lounges, which we're seeing a greater demand for, um, obviously after, after COVID. Um, and obviously, and on the right there, you can see a selection of our um, international products and the amenity spaces in there. The built form is actually, you know, an important first step in, in terms of creating a built to rent product, but it's actually how the, um, how those amenity spaces are actually managed and curated. Um, and Greystar um, originated as a, as a property manager. Um, and so the operation phase is actually embedded purely in the DNA of the business. Um, and so our on-site staff actually curate you know these spaces to encourage residents to leave their apartments um, and to actually build community you know within the development um, and we think that that's actually you know it delivers um, great outcomes in terms of mental health um, in terms of social connectivity uh, particularly as we're moving into a virtual you know and digital world where people are more connected um, you know remotely and that's obviously particularly important um, you know with COVID and and the fact that people can't meet face to face so um, having a community that you you know you you live with and and being able to know your neighbours actually results in healthier 
um, you know, healthier residents and also translates into um, you know, people renewing their leases and staying in the building for a longer period of time. Um, within Australia, um, on the next slide, um, we've got two projects currently in, uh, in development. Uh, the first one is in South Yarra, um, which we have recently received planning approval for. Um, it's the largest built to rent development to date in, in Australia, which is 625 units um, spread across two, two buildings. Um, this is a really exciting um, you know, project for us. The location is, is how we see you know, real, the, the real defining characteristics of built to rent, which is um, located in close proximity to the city and also to employment. Um, public transport with the South Yarra station right at the front door. Um, and it's just a, you know, it's a very young, um, you know, demographic who who basically, you know, who, who want to rent. Um, people who live in South Yarra are predominantly renters. Um, and they're also, you know, demanding that ultra flexibility of what build to rent can offer. Uh, we anticipate starting this in early 22 um, with a completion in, in mid 24. Um, there's also roughly two and a half thousand square metres of commercial space, um, which provides a real, you know, a real mixed use um, development. Our second project, which is on the next slide, um, is in South Melbourne, uh, Gladstone Street. This actually has a permit, a planning permit in place, um, which we're amending. Um, we're making it, you know, more tailored to a build to rent um, product. Uh, the permit was for a, for a build to sell development. Um, this development. Uh, we are also excited about because it's going to create, you know, a new benchmark in terms of the communal amenity offering. Um, in this project, is you know over over one acre of of amenity space, um, including a you know a podium rooftop that spans across all three towers. Um, it's located within the Fisherman's Bend Urban Renewal Area, um, which is once again in close proximity to the city, but not you know not within the CBD. Um, it's got great amenity surrounding the development with the South Melbourne Market and you know, and the um, Albert Park and, and Port Phillip Bay in close proximity as well. Um, this project has 700 apartments um, and also uh, just under 1,000 square metres of, of retail. Um, what we try and focus on with our developments is creating a really activated ground plane. Um, and so both projects in Australia have got publicly accessible laneways um, to encourage the community to actually you know, come into our projects. Um, for us, it's about being inclusive. Uh, we we see the strength in in having open doors and and allowing the public to you know permeate through our um, you know through our buildings and developments. And also, we uh, we develop long term relationships with the surrounding community. Yeah, as being a long term owner, um, it's very important to you know firstly deliver on what we're saying. We're going to deliver on from a planning perspective, and then also to build these strong links to the community. Um, to you know, to make sure that ongoing, it's you know, our development is successful, um, and we can also you know give back to you know to the the surrounding um, areas. Um, that that's uh, that's a brief introduction to to Greystar, um, and I look forward to answering your questions um, as we move through the rest of the panel. Great, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, so now we're going to move on to Christian Graham, who is the head of home. Take it away, Christian. Thanks, Georgia. And I'm assuming that you can see my uh, my slides up on the screen at the moment. But it's great to be with you, uh, with Georgia and the other panel members, uh, to talk a little bit about um, our organisation, Home. So I'm from Home, and our mission is to reinvent renting for our residents. We're an Australian organisation that creates, owns, and manages its own buildings. We're 100% focused on the apartments for rent space. Um, we're presently in Melbourne and Sydney, and we have a range of projects uh, varying in size. We select really high amenity locations and purposely design and build and operate those places exclusively for renters. Our first of those assets that will open will be South Bank early next year and Richmond that will open in about the middle of next year. Uh, most of those projects that you see on the screen now are under construction uh, and, and um, one or two in planning. Um, you can also see that, that many of those places have non-residential uses like office, retail or community facilities. And we see that as an important part of creating a vibrant community or place as well. So we quite like the mixed use nature um, of many of our developments. 
So we say that there's no place like home. We create great, like we, we select great locations and we, we create great buildings um, inspired by hotels and focused on our residents. And we believe that that will create a better rental experience and also a better community. At home, our values of community innovation and sustainability and safety are very important to us. And today I just wanted to touch on a couple of our initiatives that show our commitment to those initiatives and demonstrate that even at the premium end of the market, we can do our part. So the first of those is our partnership with Homes for Homes, a group that, that uh, many of you will know from the conventional residential for sale space. We have recently partnered with Homes for Homes as their foundational partner in the build to rent space. So um, our program is that taking 0.1 of a percent of uh, the rent that our um, that our residents uh, pay, we will then match and Homes for Homes will use those funds to then go and unlock affordable and social housing projects uh, for the good of the community. This is something that we're very excited about. We've led the way in this space, but we really hope that others will join. So we're very proud to have partnered with Homes for Homes recently um, in this partnership. The other is sustainability. Um, our investors and our residents will expect that we will deliver and operate sustainable places. A couple of the initiatives that I just wanted to mention were that all of our buildings across the portfolio are five star, green star, and we'll target uh, net carbon zero in operation um, across all of those assets. So we take sustainability very um, seriously, but um, we believe that, as I said earlier, our residents and our investors both expect that of us, as does the community. So a couple of final thoughts that I just wanted to mention are that um, BTR creates a better alignment between the resident and the owner uh, and a better living experience and also a better community. We believe that these buildings can be very sustainable and even at the premium end of the market can, can do their part in the affordable housing space. Whilst there's much talk about build to rent in the press and otherwise out in the community, I think you should still regard the sector as being at a nascent stage and still very formative. And really, I would say it's, it's still very much a collection of pilot projects that you're seeing out there and being written about. There's no one version of build to rent. And I think that you'll hear that today when uh, you hear a variety of views from the, from the panel. But I think that's great. And I think the difference um, provides opportunity for innovation and for each of us to learn from each other as the space forms. I honestly believe that Australia has a real opportunity to be a leader in the um, uh, rental community space. Uh, and I think that we shouldn't regard home ownership or rent as an either or. Uh, I think that, that essentially Australia needs more good housing choices, not less. And I believe that Build to Rent can provide a very positive housing choice and can add something to the communities in which it operates. Thanks, and I'm really looking forward to the panel. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Christian. And now moving on to Cameron Quinn from Assemble. Hi, thanks, Georgia. Uh, and <clears throat> thanks everyone for joining and thanks to the other panelists as well. So here at Assemble, we're uh, an end-to-end build to rent development, investment and community management group. We've really got a key focus around the, the design of occupant-centric housing and our focus on community and, and sustainability and also the affordability of our products, particularly targeting sort of the, the low to moderate income um, Australian. Looking a bit at our kind of history from our, our first development in back in 2016, um, which was um, at, at Rosemary Street and Clifton Hill, we've, we've come a long way since then um, with our, our build to rent to own pilot project in Kensington, which is about to open uh, for residents um, very shortly in the next couple of months and with the investment of Australian Super into the Assemble operating platform last year. Uh, we're now up to over 40 staff and have a pretty significant pipeline of uh, developments underway, a mixture of those, those in planning and those at, at earlier stages as well. As sort of picked up by um, Christian and Sean, obviously ESG and sustainability is a massive thing in the build to rent space. Our, our investors require it both on a debt and an equity perspective. And it's something that's increasingly focused on by residents as well. Um, and sustainability and ESG elements been a kind of a core focus for Assemble from the outset. And it was one of the key reasons why Aussie Super chose to, it chose to invest in Assemble in the first place. Uh, 
We recently released our FY21 ESG impact report, uh, which is something we do every year to kind of meaningfully track how we perform against our stated goals, which we base around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have two key models that we deliver housing under. We have the, our social and affordable build to rent, which is where I spend most of my time, uh, and our Assemble Futures product, which is our build to rent to own product, which is probably what we're most known for to date. Having a look at each of those individually. So this is our, our pilot project in Kensington on Macaulay Road. So it's, it's meant to be a, a supported pathway to home ownership. So our residents had a, a five year lease um, that they are able to have an option to get out of if they so wish. Um, and then they have a, an option to purchase at the conclusion of the lease. And the, the idea is that it kind of takes about seven years for people to save, save a home deposit. So two years of construction plus five years of renting. Um, and this way they have a, a guaranteed purchase price that they know about and they know what the rental price will be as well. So it, it gives them the ability to save towards that target um, kind of get off that treadmill of ever increasing property prices that, that makes it so hard to get into the property market. And then our other model is, is our social and affordable build to rent. So it's, it's long tenure, multifamily, mixed income, rental accommodation, more of the kind of the classic build to rent style that you see in the multifamily market in the US. Um, typically done on either, either a leasehold land basis or some uh, owned site. And it is really targeted at that sort of community and affordable housing end, that sort of low to moderate income Australia, and developed under more of a social infrastructure style model. We've also formed a partnership with Housing Choices Australia, who's a um, national tier one community housing provider, who provide 20% in, in partnership with us, provide 20% of our dwellings to community housing residents. Um, so we really see it as a scalable platform where we've got kind of significant pipeline, both in Victoria, in our, in our home state and uh, across the country as well, that we'll be announcing soon. I won't, I won't spend too much time on this, but um, I won't take George's thunder from one of the, the, the pre-planned questions, but looking at the housing supply continuum and picking up what Christian said earlier, you know, that there is a range of providers and a range of demand within the market and, it, and it's not a one size fits all product. And here at Assemble, we, we target um, more of that kind of that, that low to moderate income segment where we kind of see a bit of a void in the rental market that's not being addressed currently um, through our various products. Um, but yeah, we can, we can get into a bit more of that detail once we get into the questions. So um, thanks for having me on. And I look forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Karen. And we'll head to Dr. George now to provide some insights from the design perspective. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, I'm uh, Georgia Stoyanovic. I'm a senior lecturer in architectural design here at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and uh, Planning. Uh, recently, uh, we've received a small uh, research grant from Hallmark Research Initiative for Affordable Housing here at the University of Melbourne to explore built to rent um, housing and um, specifically to look into the future models or how uh, BTR can develop. There's a wide uh, range of um, possibilities there's a wide uh, spectrum of possibilities between uh, ownership and uh, social housing and uh, one of the ideas of this project is to look if btr can be connected uh, in some way to uh, helping uh, under supply of um, uh, affordable uh, housing uh, together with me on, on the project uh, are working uh, professor Piyush tiwari and uh, uh, Jyoti shukla from uh, property and also Erika Martino and um, Yiping uh, Tseng, uh, all from uh, University of uh, Melbourne. Uh, my background is in uh, architectural uh, design, and um, I hope to uh, contribute um, to, to this discussion by adding uh, a uh, spatial dimension uh, uh, to, to it and uh, a design uh, perspective. Uh, I would like to uh, address social uh, and environmental uh, sustainability from uh, that point of um, uh, view. Um, uh, and I would also like to establish a relationship between what architects do and establish connection with uh, finance and planning that comes uh, before the design process and then the maintenance and use uh, which, comes, uh, which come after. Uh, I don't have the presentation to share, um, I'll just outline a um, couple of pressure points or design challenges that were 
always present in multi-unit development or apartment buildings, but now have become even more pronounced uh, when we're looking into a long-term uh, rental tenure. Um, so these um, uh, design challenges, it's not a conclusive list, um, and um, uh, the first three are uh, very similar. There's a very subtle difference between them. So the first one is a personalization and um, uh, creating an ability to make physical changes uh, to uh, one's um, uh, dwelling, uh, to exercise a control over the living um, uh, environment. The second one is um, how architects can help um, creating the sense uh, of home. This uh, relationship is um, really important. It's different um, home and dwelling. The two annotations are very, uh, very different. And um, there's a link between uh, uh, one's uh, dwelling and uh, uh, well-being. So this ties into a concept of place and there's a role for uh, architects to consider what can be done if uh, we're looking into a long-term uh, rental uh, tenure. Uh, the next one is uh, spatial adaptability or flexibility, which um, uh, addresses different lifestyles and changes that households uh, uh, go through. Uh, it's a, it's a long-term uh, 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 topic present uh, in uh, architecture. Um, there's also uh, many uh, uh, changes to how families are structured, how lifestyles go. There's uh, work from home. Uh, as, uh, as a new thing, this is all very important for um, uh, long-term uh, rental development. Then there is also community building, which uh, uh, panelists have already identified. Um, there's a, a question of how uh, architecture can help uh, bonding and uh, binding together of a uh, community. Um, the importance of uh, shared facilities is uh, already mentioned. They have social, uh, economic and uh, environmental value but they also come at cost um, at certain cost and, uh, um, and there's an, there is another angle uh, uh, to, to, to that as well. Then there is maintenance which uh, has become really important uh, from for um, uh, BTR development. Um, uh, there's a long-standing concern with uh, the relationship between tenants and uh, builders in terms of uh, defects and uh, repairs. Um, there's also a growing uh, understanding of um, the duration or the lifetime of certain parts of the building, say structure, envelope, fittings. Uh, this is all coming uh, uh, as a big um, uh, uh, topic uh, in, in, um, in architectural design for uh, B BTR. And finally, there is um, environmental impact, um, the sheer size of uh, built to rent development. Um, uh, as uh, Sean mentioned, like 600 units or 700 units in, in some cases. This is a big uh, uh, opportunity to, to have an impact on the built environment and therefore the responsibility is even great and uh, um, it's already been uh, identified and mentioned by my uh, co-panelists. Um, and also uh, speaking about the environmental impact, the relationship between indoor and outdoor spaces is another really important topic uh, for such a large uh, uh, development. The list is not inclusive, con conclusive, but uh, it can it can serve as a uh, uh, a first look into uh, challenges that uh, architects uh, face, and uh, I look forward to discussing discussing some of those topics uh, further. Great, thank you very much, George. All right, so now we've actually seen that there's quite a bit of a spectrum in terms of the build to rent sector. And what we also will note is that because we're moving from an environment where we've traditionally seen our multi-residential buildings in a build to sell type model, and we've had things like negative gearing to actually kind of provide incentive for investors in that particular market. We're now starting to see this shift and these fledgling you know, developments or pilots, as uh, Christian mentioned, of these build to rent model um, type developments. And they're quite substantial, many of them. But they're also coming up against quite a number of different challenges. Because our sector or, and all the planning and the tax laws and things like that are all set up for individual ownership um, of residential property, what are some of the challenges that you're finding uh, that are the greatest? So I think I'll start off with Sean, who from Greystart, as an international organisation with um, you know, projects all over the world, what are some of the things that you're finding really difficult in the Australian market in terms of uh, setting up your build to rent projects? Thanks, Georgia. Um, I mean, the challenges we're experiencing here are challenges that we've experienced um, elsewhere in the, in the globe as 
yeah, as build to rent becomes a more established um, asset class and um, yeah, things need to change. For us in Australia, the greatest barriers are really tax and, and planning. Um, from, a, from a tax perspective, you know, there's state-based taxes and there's also federal taxes that, um, that basically mean that we're not playing on a level playing field with build to sell um, developments. So uh, land tax is, is obviously a significant um, cost, ongoing cost. Um, it hits us during um, our operation phases. Um, recently, the Victorian government has uh, announced a 50% um, discount on that for a 30-year period, which is a great you know, first step um, you know, in Victoria to really um, you know, reduce that cost burden. Um, and also in New South Wales, the government up there um, announced a discount, um, you know, a similar discount um, earlier in, in this year as well. So, you know, the, the state governments are starting to understand, um, you know, what they need to do from a land tax perspective. There's also foreign surcharges that um, have been brought in um, largely to probably um, prevent off the plan sales to foreign foreign buyers. But unfortunately, with the with where Build to Rent is in Australia at the moment, um, many of the investors, institutional investors, are actually from offshore. And so they're being caught up by you know, some of those foreign surcharge um, loopholes. At a federal level, uh, GST is, uh, we're not able to get reimbursed for, for that GST cost, unlike in build to sell development. So that adds a 10% cost base to, you know, to our development costs. Um, and there's also an MIT regime, which is a managed investment trust regime um, that results in increased withholding um, tax yeah, sort of at the back end when the investors are looking to divest assets um, for foreign investors. So once again, you know, those offshore institutional and pension funds um, are, being, are being hit by that. Um, and then from a planning perspective, just the general lack of clarity around, um, you know, the planning process and, and, and a lack of, um, you know, specific definition for build to rent and, and also from a land use perspective um, just means that there's, uh, yeah, less certainty in terms of you know going about the planning process. Um, the way that Graystar you know typically approach things is to design our buildings to be purposely you know purpose uh, rental um, properties rather than designing them to be able to be subdivided you know down the track. And so, what we really want is a build to rent use to be categorised, a definition around it, um, and also a specific guide set of design guidelines that um, you know that outline and respond to the differences between, you know, build to rent um, design and, and build to sell, which, you know, is pretty well covered by the BADS um, guidelines that have been a great, you know, a great initiative. Um, but I think there needs to be some acknowledgement that built to rent buildings are designed and operated differently. Excellent, thank you. And I might just actually pose this question as well to Christian, um, who's worked in both the build to rent and build to sell markets. Um, have you got some insights there, Christian? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think Sean's done a great job of, of covering um, most of the issues. I mean, I, I think that um, generally in uh, Melbourne and Sydney, there's a scarcity of um, of sites with uh, with planning um, with, with, with planning controls that really allow uh, developments of scale to be undertaken. And then once you overlay the complexity of built rent on top of it, it becomes extremely hard to find sites. That will that will be in the right location and be able to um, to accommodate the types of buildings that you've seen most of us talk about today. But um, and that's why when I talked about it being um, you know essentially a set of pilot projects that you're seeing at the moment, really you would need to see a lot more. Particularly in Sydney, you'd need to see um, a lot more acceleration in the rezoning. Uh, and, pro and possibly up zoning of land in metropolitan Sydney in order to see it take hold in Sydney. Sydney is, you know, maybe twice or three times as difficult as Melbourne. Um, but yeah, otherwise I think it's been covered well. Excellent. And Cam, do you have any other thoughts given that you're scaffolding multiple different elements all together in the same projects often? Yeah. Um, I think for us around, you know, you know, planning, it's really the time that it takes. It's, it's a pretty complex and, and long-winded process. So, I mean, going from, you know, finding a site and acquiring the site to actually being able to get on site and constructing can be, you know, two plus years. And in terms of the ability of the private sector to really kind of, I guess, meet the, the housing affordability crisis and provide more housing in, in a short period of time, it, it does hamper our ability to really roll out a portfolio. 
because it just takes so long for us to be able to get, get works underway. Excellent. Oh, yeah, Christian? Sorry, Georgia, can I, I just wanted to pick up on one of the points that Sean raised that the audience might not um, might not might not appreciate unless I just unpack it a bit. Sean talked about about um, the barriers for foreign capital coming into the space, and and Cam talked before about having Australian Super as a partner, which is fantastic. But Australian Super is one of very few super funds that are in the space at this point. Many Australian Super funds invest several billion dollars offshore in B, in BTR at, at this time, but they're not yet invested in Australia. Now that will happen in time, but it's not going to happen. You know, next year, maybe it happens the year after, maybe it happens the year after that. What's very different about Build to Rent is that you're not cycling the capital through. Each time you go and build one of these things and, and any of the developments that, that any of us are talking about, probably a couple hundred million dollars invested in any one of those buildings, but you're not cycling it back through. So, you've, so you're cumulatively having to build up that capital base. And so the, the amounts of money that are required to uh, to build up a portfolio of projects, the likes of any of us have talked about, it's pretty extensive. So you need very deep pools of capital coming into Australia, just like office or industrial or any other asset class. You really need that foreign capital to make it happen. And so I just wanted to unpack that into the audience. And that's why that foreign capital is so important in the next couple of years. Right. Thanks, Christian. I was just picking up on Sean's comment around some of the challenges in planning and design. Um, Roger, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I'd like to pick up on uh, the idea of uh, design guidelines. And uh, I, I think that's um, uh, an excellent idea that would bring in more clarity. And uh, if uh, some of the items that I've uh, spoken on introductory bit could be addressed with those, those new design guidelines, I think that would be uh, really helpful. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, planning and construction regulation, which uh, safeguard uh, uh, well-being and, and safety of uh, people uh, in buildings. And then if we look at the planning provisions, there is this hierarchy between objective uh, standards and then come the, uh, the guidelines. And so in that space, uh, uh, we could uh, be looking at uh, more specific and clear uh, needs of uh, built to uh, rent developments in contrast to um, uh, built to, uh, uh, to sell. There is also room for uh, greater importance uh, for the design respo response. And uh, so this is uh, stipulated in the planning provisions because each of the uh, um, uh, sites and every context that, that we're looking for an architectural project has its own specificities. So in that in that sense, uh, design response comes uh, really important. Again, could be related to um, uh, specific uh, design uh, guidelines. Right. Thank you. I'm just going to jump across to a uh, question from Sophie, who just wanted to know and get some clarity around what are some of the key differences between the build to rent product and the build to sell product. Um, Christian, how about I start with you? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, obviously you've got the um, the generally more extensive amenity spaces. So so central communal amenities generally in most of the, for most of the BTR groups that you're, that you're hearing from today, the, the, the spaces may vary and the, and the types of uses in the amount, but generally you're gonna have more, pro, more communal amenity space. I would also say that um, because these buildings are being held for the long term, they're generally designed with that durability in mind. So you're gonna make choices about material selections, um, different energy uses to try and bring down the running costs of those buildings as well. And, and then you get down to practical things like the, like the back of house for these buildings. If you're going to have people moving in and moving out more frequently, perhaps um, the loading and unloading uh, and some of those sorts of practical considerations become more important as well. So, you know, I'd say that so they're somewhere between a conventional residential building and a hotel, somewhere on that spectrum and BTRs probably, you know, depending on which group, it's maybe more towards the hotel than the residential building in some instances. Excellent. And we've actually got a few comments um, or questions uh, from Merrick and Jesse around those shared facilities that you were talking about, Chris. Um, so I might start with George. Um, what kind of cost do you see associated with, you know, these shared facilities? 
Okay, the finance is not exactly uh, my expertise, but uh, the, the the finance for that has to come from from somewhere, and uh, you know they're they're added benefit. So you know there is there are two sides uh, uh, of uh, of that story. I think they're socially uh, important because these are the spaces where neighbors uh, can can meet. They also have uh, an economic uh, uh, value because they might cut down some of the expenses that households would meet individually. Let's say a shared laundry is a place where people can meet, but it's also uh, a way to avoid having an individual washing machine in each of the in each of the units. So there are two different uh, uh, benefits, but uh, they they can be exaggerated as well, and they might not suit everyone's liking. So there is a very fine balance between the need and uh, uh, satisfying everyone within the same community with uh, with what uh, that uh, shared space uh, uh, brings. Yeah, and, and picking up on that, sorry, Georgia. Um, yeah, just having, I guess our approach, similar to, to what Christian was talking about, is obviously, you know, we're going to own these assets for, for a very long time. So it, it is the design inside of it is very important. But that kind of approach to communal facilities is very much about that social side of it and the community side of it. It's, you know, it's not about trying to earn money out of those facilities. You know, we don't charge for them, we provide them for free. It's about creating a community environment that's going to make tenants want to stay there for longer. Because ultimately, yeah. the longer that we can hold our tenants within these buildings, the better they perform over the over the longer term. And, and the approach to that, I think, is quite different to a traditional sort of build to sell development. You know, build to sell development, all of the focus is on, you know, get it and get it out quickly to turn it over to, to make a profit. But it's also about, well, we'll focus on pre-selling all of the all of the apartments and then after we've done that, we'll think about putting a four lease sign in the in the front of the building and hopefully an IGA pops in there at some point. Whereas the approach to, to build to rent, which is, I think, consistent across the industry, is, is more about, well, establishing that ground floor plane. And, you know, how do we establish that and curate that to, to best meet the needs of the community and the residents and kind of the broader local community as well to kind of encourage people to come in and interact and really activate the space so that it's a space that people want to be and the kind of the community wants to continue to hang around and then that's how you, you kind of generate more demand and keep people in your buildings for longer. Yeah. And then, um, to, sorry, Georgia, just to, to Cameron's point, um, you know, with, uh, with the amenity spaces, um, typically in built to rent, they're in the best parts of the building, um, which is quite different to a built to sell approach where you might have, you know, penthouse apartments up the top level. Um, what we try and do is put, you know, the amenity spaces on the top level or where the best views are so that everybody can, you know, every, all the residents can enjoy it. And I think that democratised approach to amenity, you know, it sort of takes away the kind of the revenue side of things because it's actually saying that, um, yeah, it's it's for everyone to enjoy. Um, and, yeah, it really unlocks that longer-term value by um, providing facilities that people actually want to use. You know, you go into a lot of developments that have been built to sell developments that have been completed with, with nice amenity spaces, but no one actually uses them. Um, which is sort of the opposite of what we want from a build to rent perspective. We want to design these spaces that people actually want to use. Um, and it's also important not to create, you know, big open areas where people feel kind of awkward, you know, catch up with friends if there's another group of people you know, next to them. So it's quite important to look at how the spaces get used and creating a range of sizes and a mix of, you know, semi-private, private, and then, um, you know, fully public areas as well so that, it just gives diversity in terms of how people can use the spaces and, and ideally use them a lot more frequently. Yeah, Christian, you had a thought there too? Yeah, if I could, I just wanted to add something um, to, to what Sean said. I was speaking up a point before that Georgie made um, and, and Cam as well. There's the physical space as the resident amenity, but then there's also the programming of it as well. So you've got, you've got sort of two aspects to it. You're trying to create these spaces which are flexible and can be used for different things. And then you're overlaying with it um, different different activities or you know opportunities for the community to come together, which really bring those spaces to life, which you know hopefully lead to a you know better, better, more integrated community and a and a you know, more enjoyable way of life for the residents as well. So there's, there's a physical and the programming aspect, which is which is different to what would happen in a conventional, you know, residential for sale building because you you don't have those people on site. You don't you don't have the person at the ground floor um, that's that's making sure that that um, that ground floor that Cam articulated is 
you know, safe and providing the surveillance there. And you also don't have someone that's there all the time to organise the community events on the top floor, like Sean mentioned. Excellent. And just on, I suppose, well maintaining those um, community spaces, um, just I've got a question around, you know, how, how are these actually maintained over decades of time? And so that tenants don't feel like they're not welcome, you know, decades. So think much further into the future than you know, current and present. Um, I'm happy to to take the lead on this one. Um, look, in terms of how we approach things, from a maintenance perspective, we've got on-site staff who, you know, whose full-time job is to is to maintain the building, um, whether that's cleaning up, you know, um, spilled coffees or drinks, or actually replacing, um, you know, pieces of furniture or equipment that are damaged or, or wear out over time. Um, the other thing that we're always looking at when we're looking at our the operating costs is is a maintenance um, program and, and trying to do you know proactive maintenance to minimize um replacement costs and also downtime because what we don't want to happen is is have our amenity spaces offline for you know, long periods of time um which then obviously doesn't deliver the product outcomes that our residents want um in terms of how we yeah you know, how we adjust over decades and make it relevant i suppose what we try and do is is not be too um, trend based so we try and come up with a mix of facilities that you know are obviously delivering what people want now but can also adapt flexibly um, you know, with time and, and retain relevance um so yeah it's a, it's obviously a hard thing to do when you're looking you know decades in advance but it's the idea is to try and keep the spaces you know reasonably flexible and um and not having to change things like structure and, and concrete but just being able to allow you know joinery and replace finishes and maybe, Ken, given that you've got quite a combination, um, have you got any thoughts on how you're planning for this across the different uh, styles of development? Yeah, that's so you know what Sean said. It's the, the adaptability and reuse of these spaces is, is really important. Kind of having multifunctional spaces that are kind of you know going to become redundant at some point. You know they, they can be reused for other things and can be used for also multiple things through the day. A big thing for us is around having community rooms and spaces that can be used for multiple things through the day. Whether it's you know like a bicycle workshop in the morning and you know mums and bubs groups through the day in the afternoon and then a residence event in the evening as well. Um, in terms of how these are funded, it is different to, you know, in, a, in sort of a, a build to sell environment, you know, you pay body corporate fees every year, which goes into a sinking fund that kind of maintains the building through time. But um, obviously, none of those costs are passed on to residents here. So we do a lot of work around forecasting what, you know, those costs are going to be out sort of, you know, 60 years in advance, what are our replacement cycles going to be, what's our preventive maintenance plan, all of those sorts of things, so that we can reserve money in advance in order to fund those obligations because you know, we don't want to, well, we can't, and when we don't look to pass those on to residents, that's something that we as the manager will manage and um, you know, pay for through time. Excellent, thank you. All right, so now we're gonna move on to looking at sustainability, which often, you know, particularly in, in you know, individual investment products of mum and dads and um, has often suffered from a split incentive issue where you know, the benefits are not particularly coming to the landlord um, as a result of you know the investment um, put in but the built to rent sector kind of actually offers you know a bit of a, a different view on this and actually can actually generate some you know substantial changes in the types of product that are developed and just kind of linking in with one of the questions from Effie um, is also around you know net zero targets so Christian you know sustainability and climate risk and net zero obligations what kind of investor appetite are you seeing here? Is this coming from both, you know, investors as well as uh, your perceived tenants as well? Yeah, uh, we believe it comes from both ends, but comes from both uh, the investors um, locally and offshore, and we believe it'll be pretty important to um, to the residents as well. And, and when I say the residents, we're expecting that the the the, the main target market is probably mid twenties to to say forty. Now there'll be people either side of it, but that's that's generally what we expect is the as the cohort so so they're going to kind of be on the on the younger side um, so we think that both both of those groups are uh, pushing us towards more sustainability um, as you said before it's much easier to incorporate uh, sustainability aspects into build to rent than it is into build to sell for a cup a couple of reasons there's a direct correlation with you know if, if you can make the building 
more sustainable and less costly to run. That's an obvious benefit to the landlord. Um, and when it's clear that your um, target audience is, is target audiences are requiring higher sustainability measures for, from you, then you know you got to listen to your audience. Um, and the other the other thing that's that's probably maybe um, a little less obvious is when you when you're doing a building for sale and you look at something like I don't know gas hot plates for example. You know, the developer's not going to take the gas hot plates out because, well, you know, what if someone wants those? I don't want that to be a disincentive to sale. But when you own the whole building and you're looking at things like the running cost, the insurances, the sustainability requirements, you, you can make that call, you know, kind of, you know, with a different lens. And so, uh, yeah, I think the short answer is yes, I think there are um, better and more opportunities in the BTR space than the BTS space to get sustainable outcomes in. And then hopefully that kind of might lead the way a little bit for the BTS space in time. Excellent. Thanks, Christian. And Sean, what are your thoughts? Are you getting you know, interest and, you know, I suppose, demand from your investors uh, in the organisation in terms of, you know, driving more sustainable outputs and products? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, similar to what Christian, Christian has experienced, um, you know, our investors um, are, are really placing even more um, you know, focus on on our on the assets they invest in being sustainable and, and increasing the sustainability performance. Um, many of the investors that we're you know, we're working with um, in our Australian fund um, are based in Europe and, and I think what's becoming apparent to us as we're you know, progressing the design of our Australian projects is that you know, Europe is probably more advanced in terms of looking at you know, carbon reduction um, and energy and, and climate change. And um, I think there's definitely some challenges for us in Australia to to actually formulate the right approach. Um, it's quite interesting, you know, looking at net zero and, and, and going sort of all electric, which is sort of the best, um, the best approach to achieving that net zero outcome. Um, but at the moment, the Australian grid is really dirty. And, and right now, actually having gas hot plates is probably a shorter term better outcome from a sustainability perspective, but it's going to create issues you know, longer term as the grid becomes um, decarbonised and, and more sustainability renewable sorry, renewable power sources come online. So, you know, I think the it, it's it's interesting. Like we need to maintain that longer term view um, to basically be able to create change and, and drive outcomes that you know are going to support this sort of whole. Um, you know, movement towards reducing the, the, the global um, climate change um, impact. And Georgia, what do you think about from actually designing the, um, you know, more sustainable aspects into these buildings? Is it something that's easily done or is it a bit more challenging? Of course, it's it's a challenge. It's a big challenge. And there are, you know, two almost two kinds of sustainability that we can look into. One is a social and the other one is environmental. And again, they will both... Uh, come with the, with the cost. Uh, the environmental one is more clear because standards are, are, are more um, uh, easy to, uh, to understand and to implement into design. The other one, the social sustainability is again tied to something that we spoke about earlier on and those are the design guidelines. And in uh, practice in, in Victoria at the moment, architects use uh, apartment design guidelines for Victoria and they use livable housing design guidelines which are well worth for um, multi unit development in general, but they do not pick up on specifics of um, um, uh, rental tenure. And uh, again, this would uh, help uh, maintain social sustainability and uh, would put uh, uh, higher design demands for um, uh, um, uh, built to rent uh, uh, development. Right. And Cam, just moving across to you, I noticed that we've had a comment from Andy as well around you know, amenity afforded in the long-term rental kind of sector. You know, how does this kind of align with your sustainability objectives and your projects? Yeah, yeah, and, and what Andy was raising, and obviously, so we have our own internal design guide within Assemble that we provide to our, our architects and our, our builders, which is obviously based on meeting and exceeding the badge requirements in the Victorian context. Um, obviously, the, the renters, occupant-centric housing is being designed to be rented and, and lived in it is a little bit of a different approach to, to build to sell, but ultimately there are certain um, minimums that you do need to meet um, sort of basic human living and that sort of thing. 
um, from a sustainability perspective, it's, it's something that we're massively focused on and, and picking up on what Christian and Sean have said from, from a capital perspective, um, all of our equity and, and debt are very focused on it. It's something that, you know, they certainly have a lot of targets around ESG and sustainability that, that they need to meet from their side. And it's something that's kind of been ingrained in us from the beginning that we've always sought to, to provide. I mean, you know, we're, we're sort of net, net zero from an operational perspective. We, we do have, you know, induction cooktops and things. And I guess to, to address kind of any of those grid issues, so we signed a, a power purchase agreement directly with the, with the renewable provider so that we know that we're getting 100% green energy for all of our dwellings as well. Um, and picking up on what Christian said around, you know, in, in a long-term build to rent context, the ability to actually incorporate these sustainability angles, I, I think is a lot greater because you've got a lot more focus on actually operating this asset and owning it for a long time into the future rather than kind of, you know, building it and selling it and moving on to the next one, right? You're ultimately, if there's going to be an increase in cost in the future, because you know, there, there's been a change in environmental policy or, you know, your, your building's chewing up too much energy, then ultimately that's on, on you as the manager. So that's what you need to focus on in order to, to generate that positive outcome, both for the residents and the community. Excellent. And I think also by focusing on these longer term sustainability outcomes, you, you know, you're going to drive a higher value. Your assets are going to be, um, you know, future proof. They're actually going to have a higher value in, in the future. Um, if you ever do, you know, you want to divest them, whether it's in a portfolio basis or individual assets. Um, so, you know, the decisions you make now can actually help you down the track um, and can be, in a way, cheaper to, it's cheaper to install, you know, the, the capital LA now rather than retrofitting, you know, different systems in, in 10 years' time. Just just want to add one final um, thought on that point. Um the other, the other one that's maybe not so obvious is because you're talking to the residents so much more frequently and, you know, it, and often in a group, you have an opportunity to also keep sustainability and the way that they use their apartments um, uh, sustainably. You have that opportunity to continue that dialogue with them and make it front of mind for them. So you've kind of got the the owner, the operator and the resident able to always be talking about that as well. Maybe not as obvious, but yeah, that's a, that's another benefit uh, in the BTR space. Yeah, and that kind of links into Rachel's question around how much are renters involved in, say, the design discussions and, you know, discussions around what types of amenities that are provided? Um, I'm happy to lead on that because, it, I mean, the, and, and Sean's spoken pretty extensively about... Um, Greystar's huge presence um, around the world. Um, we, we, we went and looked at, at experiences in the US and, um, and also the UK uh, before, when we were setting up the brief for our first buildings four or five years ago. And then obviously we wanted to bring a very Australian touch to that. Um, so, you know, we have, we've run uh, focus groups for all of our buildings. We've with local groups of people that we think fit into the kind of, you know, the, the, the target market. So short answer is in our instance, you know, quite a bit of involvement from 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 um, what we see as being the the target market. Now in time, I'm sure we're going to get some of it wrong, but we have, we've, you know, even before we started, we've sort of tried to bring in, um, you know, the residents perspective before we even put pen to paper. Thanks. And Georgia, just from our, from our perspective, um, one of the benefits with having such a large um, you know, amount of units that we manage globally, um, it means we've got a massive database of, of customers that we can you know, tap into. And so um, every year we do you know, regular um, surveys and, and that's focused on you know, what they like about the design, what they don't like about the design, um, what they like about the operations and the service you know, side of things. And so what that means is that we can you know, we can adjust our approach on on future projects based on almost real time you know, data, um, and I think it's also important in terms of how we approach things because we don't want to be like Kodak where we've you know we get we've got a successful business model but we don't adapt. Um, we're very cognizant of the fact that um, you know we've been doing you know a, a good product um, in the US particularly, but throughout you know Europe for a while. Um, but things are changing all the time and. You know, you've got different models like what Assemble are doing, you know, in Australia, but then equally there's, you know, that kind of um, crossover from hotels and, and that 
you know, ser- hospitality type approach is infiltrating even in built terrain. And so what we, you know, what we're always doing is is looking at what's the next evolution of of you know, built terrain. Um, and the good thing for us in Australia is that we can tap into all the expertise and the lessons learned um, from our international parts of the business, and hopefully, you know, avoid some of the issues that they've yeah you know, they've had and, and worked through. But once again, I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. Thanks, Sean. Um, so with this new build rent market, do you think there should be mandatory requirements uh, for increased sustainability levels? And also um, on that note, um, given we're in an affordable housing symposium, um, whether a proportion of affordable housing should also be requested um, as part of that mandatory process. So I'm going to start with Cam on this one. Sure. Um, I, think, I think that it probably largely needs to be market led on, on these things. Um, from a sustainability perspective, I think that there's there's always benefits in, in, in mandating, you know, increased sustainability and in in those sorts of things. It's, it's better for kind of the economy in the longer term as well. And I think it's, you know, as you've kind of seen from, you know, what all of us have been talking about today, it's a central focus for what we're doing um, in, in the build to rent space. And I think that kind of all of the large build to rent operators are really focused on increasing that sustainability side of things. So. I don't think that there is necessarily a need to kind of mandate particular requirements around sustainability because I think the private market's already doing it. Um, in terms of an affordability perspective, it's it's a difficult one. Um, I think that affordability is 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 relative, um, and it's very relative to the type of of residents who are who are within your dwelling. So, you know, here at Assemble, we target affordability to to low to moderate income Australians. Right? That that doesn't mean that you know a, a premium product has to have affordability or doesn't have to have affordability. It's, it's targeting a different market. And there, there is a very wide spectrum of the market in Australia and, and a wide demand of housing that's needed. So we kind of need operators at all ends from kind of the social and community housing end all the way up to the, the premium end because there is a demand for that product. So I guess the, the issue with, with mandating, I guess, a certain level of affordability is are you going to crowd out the, you know, those, those higher end products that, you know, if, if they come into the market, well, then perhaps other, you know, cheaper build to sell products, people will move out of those and that'll create some more capacity within the market that will then become more affordable for, for other people within the economy. So certainly, I mean, what we do is certainly very focused on, on affordability. You know, 20% of our dwellings are for social and community housing, which is at a significant discount to market. Um, and then the other 80% is, is a mixture of, you know, a discount to market and a market product to kind of all targeting that affordability level. So I think if there is going to be any kind of mandates around it, then it, it probably needs to be more linked in kind of a carrot basis rather than a stick. You know, if, if you provide certain levels of affordability, then you'll get, you know, advantageous planning outcomes or you'll get some tax concessions or something along those lines rather than start saying you have to do this otherwise you can't do anything at all. Yeah, which could be quite detrimental for the market, particularly at this early stage. Um, Christian, have you got any comments? You already manda- or already have an internal mandate for Five Star Green Star for your, for your Yeah, I'll, I'll, look, I was just going to pick up on the affordable housing point. I think um, Cam was absolutely spot on. I th- you know, you saw in our presentation um we elected to go the way of um, of contributing to Homes for Homes, and our view is that they, the, the multiplier that they get from every dollar that we provide is something like eight times, and we think that's a very efficient way to do our part. And you know, said we're we're, we're aiming for the premium end of the rent, rental um, market, but we still want to be able to do our part. I, I'm not necessarily a supporter of of inclusionary zoning of affordable housing unless there's a, a sort of incentive. Um, base to it. I think if you're going to do it, um, an element of key worker housing, or, you know, that that, that type of uh, inclusion um, is probably is less of a challenge economically and otherwise. But I think you know, the closer you get to social housing, the the the, the harder it becomes to integrate different levels of management. I think it genuinely creates a lot of complexity. So probably not in favour of that. Uh, but, you know, as I said at the start, I mean, you know, unprompted, we wanted to be able to do our part, even though we're aiming at the, the premium end. So that answers the question. Great, thanks. Um, Sean, any thoughts? And we're just going to have to wrap up fairly quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I, I agree with both um, Cameron and Christian. 
Um, I think mandating things can be can be difficult, and I think having a more of an incentivised approach, yeah, you know, generally gets a better outcome um, for for everything. Um, it's interestingly, it's interesting that you, you're framing the question around should it be mandatory for build to rent. Um, I think if it was going to be mandated, it really should be across the board. Um, it shouldn't just be applying to build to rent. It should be you know, any development um, having to comply with you know, the mandate. But then I think equally, um, if it was mandated and there is more affordable housing within build to rent developments, that is a good thing because um, I think it's you know, more cross representative of the of the wider community, um, particularly you know, getting the key worker housing in there, um, I think is a, is a good thing. Um, one of the benefits of build to rent is that it can be more efficient from a management perspective. Um, so, you know, overseas we manage a lot of the affordable housing you know, units and in places like New York, um, there is an incentive approach. So you can get extra levels on your building if you provide a certain percentage of affordable housing. But Graystar actually manages those units. And so what that means is it becomes a lot more integrated within the, the building community. Um, and it also takes some pressure off some of the community housing providers who um, you know, um, who rely on government funding to, you know, to, to run their business. And so we can kind of do a lot of that day-to-day -day management that just takes some pressure off those um, organisations. Excellent. Now, we have the chat going crazy with lots of questions, but unfortunately we've actually hit the four o'clock mark and we need to round it up. Um, so I'd love to thank my presenters today and the panellists. Uh, it's been fantastic and thank you also the organisers of the Housing Assembly. Um, does anyone have any final comments they'd like to make? No, everyone's disappearing. So um, <laughs> thank you everyone for attending and thank you everyone for the questions. Hopefully we can look at some answering or delving into those in the future sessions. So thank you very much everyone and thanks for listening. Thanks so much to Georgia, Cameron, Sean and Georgia. That was a, a session that prompted so many questions. I can see lots of them that haven't been answered as yet and no doubt lots of comments as well. Such an interesting, interesting area. So many varieties and, and permutations in that build to rent space. And I think we'll be hearing a whole lot more about that as well. So um, thanks so much for your great participation there, everybody. Now it's time for you all to be magically spirited over to our next session. That's about accessibility, affordability, agency, housing for people with disabilities. So that will, uh, you'll be you'll be there very soon. Uh, if you have any tech problems, of course, um, shout out to our event support staff.